back just a little bit. We didn't make a lot, a lot of progress last week. And I'm not worrying how we make it through these notes. I'm giving myself a certain amount of time. I know that there's work and there's school. I'm trying to be mindful of that. Uh, I'm, you know, we want the Holy Ghost to move, but there are times where we're going to just try to be respectful as well. Amen. So we've been talking about worship. And uh, when we looked at worship, uh, to start out with, uh, we, we were looking at what is worship uh, and how do we know how to worship? The Word of God says that we need to worship in spirit and in truth. We talked about um, the importance of realizing that God lives in worship because the Word of God says that God inhabits or He lives in the praises of His people. And so God doesn't live at 229 Hill Street. Uh, God lives not even at your residence as long as you may not always be there. But God lives in our worship and our praise. Some folks never really get to know that God inhabits their life and within them because they never really find themselves in the place of praise that God wants them to be. Praise isn't just, um, we're talking about this tonight, we're talking about the act of worship, but praise is not just uh, our lifting of our voice, but it's in every area of our life, everything that we do, we worship God. In our devotion to Him, uh, you know, the way that we conduct ourselves in every manner brings praise to God. And so that is worship. And so when we live like Christ does, well, the devil just won't win. Amen. Uh, we need to make sure that we keep his commandments and that we love him. And the big part of worship is obedience to him. The Lord, of, uh, the, the songwriter wrote, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The book of Revelation said, He that hath the ear, let him hear. It's not just hearing, but it's the obeying. I said on Sunday night, I said, Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Amen. It's worship to God. So we were looking last week about what worship is, uh, uh, what the act of worship, and what that means. And so uh, uh, that God has chose us to worship Him and that uh, uh, worship is a lifestyle. It's our, our very beings to worship Him, pleasing Him in every way. And uh, we were talking, uh, and we did not finish completely talking about this, but worship can be in our brokenness. When Mary brought the alabaster box, the broken box, was the brokenness of it was a fragrance of worship that that uh, extruded from it because the brokenness was worship to God. Sometimes our greatest worship can be our brokenness before God. It's disturbing to me if we never see tears around the altar, if we never see crying in God's house. I know that we're all different. Some folks will say, well, women are more emotional than men, and then personality is even different in some ways. Some folks are more emotional by their personality. Well, you know, whatever that brokenness is, whether it's crying, and I do believe that all of us have been made to cry. I'm not talking about just being a cry baby. I'm just talking about being broken before God, allowing our brokenness to be worshipped before Him. Amen. And so uh, the last verse that we read, second page, almost at the bottom, the last verse that we read last week, according to my notes, is, O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of my affliction. Amen. God takes our afflictions. He loves to get in them. Amen. He'll never waste an affliction. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but sometimes, I said this last week, we are fixers. And sometimes as Christians, we are fixers. And some people who know themselves called to ministry feel they need to fix it for everybody. 
God doesn't call us to fix people's problems. We can't do it in ourselves anyway. Sure, if we can lend a hand, if we can help. But there are times where we just need to journey with people in the middle of their affliction. Amen. And we need to allow their affliction just to roll out and for God to be magnified in it. Could anyone fix Job's affliction? No one can do it, Brother Eli. Uh, his friends came and they all uh, pointed their finger. And Job just had to wait it out. But in the middle of his affliction, this was a great man. He was a blessed man. He loved God. The magnitude of who he was on many levels was great. Most of all, the magnitude of his righteousness, sacrificing for his children. He was definitely the priest of his home. He loved, he wanted his family to honor God. But the bottom line, in the middle of his affliction, is when God was most glorified. We think about worship as the last verse there in Psalms, where in all this, Job worshiped God. He said not, but he worshiped. All this seems like a very small phrase. But when you look at the magnitude of everything that's stuck in there, Job was a worshiper. He shaved his head. He rent his mantle. He fell down upon the ground and he worshiped God. Even though he was sick, even though he was grieving, even though he was misunderstood by people, he still worshiped God. That is worship, my friend. When someone's not feeling well, but they press through in worship. When life is not going good, but they don't just cry, but they worship. Amen. When people even misjudge and misunderstand, but yet the real worshiper, it doesn't matter. They're there to worship. They know their heart. Someone read 2 Corinthians 4.17. For our light affliction, which, but, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a more, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now this is going to, this verse is, a paragraph is going to talk about this. But let me ask you this. You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you here has ever had an affliction? I know I have. Uh, you know, they can be body. They can be uh, uh, physical things around us relationship, they can be because of bad choices, they can be because of someone else's bad choice, you know, because that rippling effect rolls out. Uh, so, however that is, all of us have felt that of affliction before. Now, the Word of God says that it is a light affliction. How many has ever felt like when you were in your affliction it was light? Anyone feel like it was light? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. Well, the Word of God makes a good point here. Let's read this next phrase. It seems our trials last more than a moment to us. Sometimes we have to have afflictions to turn our focus, to turn our focus back to God. He wants us to lean on Him, to depend on Him, and to trust Him. When everything is going good, we tend to draw away from it. Afflictions and trials draw, draw us back. Afflictions and trials draw us back to Him. Now, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. A lot of you folks have been here many, many years. A lot of you have seen a lot that I've seen. But how many have ever noticed that when people's having problems, we can see them in church? Amen. But when the problems are over, we don't really see them anymore. <laughs> Us as believers, sometimes we can really press into the things of God when we're having afflictions. But when we're not like we kind of back off and take the easy, breezy passage. I think that's human nature. That's right, brother. God uses our afflictions as an opportunity for us to worship Him. It really puts our focus on God. 
So God, there are times in our life where we will go through things. Sometimes it's because God's will has been for us, because God, whom He loved, love it, the Bible says, He chastens. Sometimes it's not God's fault. It's our fault. Sometimes the enemy's fighting against us. God allows that. So there's many reasons why we face afflictions, but there's one thing for sure. Our afflictions are meant for us to worship God. Someone read Matthew 8, 2. Matthew 8, 2. And behold, there came a lover and worshiped him, saying, Lord, I will, thou canst make me clean. This lover came to Jesus. And he wanted to be healed, didn't he? Do you think he wanted to be healed from leprosy? I think quite obviously he did. It infringed upon his life. He was, he was sick. He knew that it was probably one of the death of him. It, 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 it did all the things that did the other leper. It cast him outside the city. Took him away from those that they loved. And so it really changed his life. And so here this leper is and he seeks Jesus. And the Bible says that he came down from the mountain, eh, 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 Jesus, and great multitude followed him. The Bible says uh, that, that, that here was this leper. And he, he came and he saw Jesus, recognized him as the Messiah. And did he immediately say, Jesus, heal me? No. The Bible says that there was a leper and he came and worshipped him. How many times do you think that we've come to Jesus with our needs and our petitions, but we forgot about the element of worship, that even in our affliction, that worship can change the status of where we are at? Sometimes instead of focusing alone upon our need and our affliction, and sometimes as pain, pain is it, it, pain is very real to the person that is experiencing it. Some folks may have may may have a. I, I've seen some people they they come to where I've worked and they have a high pain tolerance. And you look at how can they endure it? And then you've seen other people that they have a very low pain tolerance. And you think, oh, you know, maybe you should find. Now, that's just my opinion, but pain is subjective, isn't it? it until, you're, until you're experiencing it, you really don't know what it's like. And so here it is, this pain is subjective to this person, but one thing that we know, that they broke through the pain and they worship God. That's amazing to me. That is real worship tonight. When we break through the pain of anything that we're going through, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, but we choose to break through that and we worship God. Is there anything with that wrong with asking God for a healing? No, He purchased our healing. But I think there's something to be said about the Bible example of those who are in their affliction and they came and they worshiped as they presented their petition to God. Someone read Matthew 9, 18. Matthew 9, 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Wow. 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 Think about this with me for a moment. The grief of losing someone, but the grief of losing a child. I've been friends with someone over the past several months and they lost their child at eight years old of cancer. And as they relate to me, you know, I felt, felt the pain in my, and my heart breaks to think that they went through that. So can you imagine that your daughter is lying dead? But the Bible says that this ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter even now is dead, but come and lay hands on her. 
the very first thing he did was worship. You no, know, even in the worst of life's crisis, we know that God can change it. But even in the worst of situations, to be able to come into the presence of Jesus and worship. It changes everything. He came and he worshiped Brother Eli. And then there was that sense of knowing that God could do the impossible. I wonder what it would be like for us tonight, whatever we may go through in life, feeling like it was huge and big and surmountable, but being able to come and worship. And the effects of worship changes and gives us the hope of possibilities, even in a grim situation with me. But, brother, what's here? But, yeah, I then would be in my right stay here. I can even walk through the day when my life turned out. And we prayed and shouted out. And within the third day, I was going back to work. I was living, but I was going back to work. Pre food of prayer and prayer. No doctor, no doctor, just Peter. Amen. Amen. There's something to be said about worship, even when we're not feeling well. Someone read Matthew uh, 15, 25. And she came to worship him, saying, Lord, help me. She came and she worshiped him. She was coming on behalf of her daughter. How many of us carry burdens as parents? Boy, I, I've learned so much. And I, I'm a listener. Someone just said to me yesterday, my son is 45 and I still worry about him. Mm. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, you mean it's not going to change when they turn 18? <laughs> I knew better, but I was just trying to make a light. But here it is. No matter what we carry, even as parents, to be able to worship before we present even the needs of our children before God. Someone read uh, Matthew 18, verse number 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Amen. How many of us need God to have patience with us? Part of it is worship. Allowing ourselves to worship. These people all needed, they all needed something from God. Their very need was worship to God. God wants us to need Him and trust Him. Let's stop there for a moment. Your needs tonight, whatever they are, they, whatever they are, they may be to you something that is special to your heart, but to God, it is an act of worship. When we come before Him and we worship and we trust Him and then we present to Him what our needs are, God wants us to trust Him. God wants us to present our needs to Him. As we went to God in prayer tonight for your needs and for your loved ones, God loves that. That is worship and that is trust. He wants every area of our life to be given to Him. You think the bill that you have is big? Amen. God says, will you worship me and trust me in the bill? God says, your health, your situation, will you trust me with your health? Uh, you may say, but my family and my relationships. God says, would you trust me with your family and with your relationship, your job? No matter what it is, God wants us to trust Him with our needs. And when we do, it's worship to Him. Amen. God's not just looking for us to throw up our hands and lift up our voice. God, yes, wants our clapping. We'll talk about it in a minute. God wants our shouting. But God also wants our needs. That is worship when we give it to Him. 
Amen. Amen. I love when the leper came and fell down and worshipped him. Amen. Uh, the, the, the woman with the issue of blood, she reached out and her reaching out to touch him was worship to him. Jerry is trusting God with your daughter. That is worship to him. Blind Bartimaeus, other people may tell you to be quiet, but you presenting your need to God, that is worship to him. That's why even when we take up our prayer request, it is still worship to God as we give Him our petitions. It's saying, God, I trust You. God, I believe in You. God, I worship You, so I give it to You. How many of you have ever known someone that is your resource? You know, as children, our parents are our resource. Maybe our grandparents. Uh, you know, when you go to the bank to buy your house or your car, you know, you're pretty compliable with them with whatever they say. They say sign on the dotted line. Okay, I'll be transparent. Sometimes I just sound without reading. I trust them. I need that long. <laughs> Sister Tina says you need something here, 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 here. I just trust her, Brother Doug. You know why? Because I have confidence in her, and I know she has the power to execute to give me that money. Not always worship her, but... I have a fond trust and respect. When we have that fond trust and respect for God, when he says, Son of God, you say, You're God, yeah. You to give it to you. And it is worship. It is a commitment. It is a belief that something you don't have, you have a resource that He has. And He is. The resource that is unlimited. Let me say it this way. Jesus Christ is truly the only unlimited resource. Amen. Other resources may deplete. He will never deplete. So our worship is saying, I give to you and I trust you. Let's move on. So we've talked. Does anyone care to share anything right here where you've trusted God with a burden and it was worship? Has anyone ever, and you don't need to share your story if you don't want to, but anyone ever been so heavy hearted? Sometimes you felt it's hard to worship, but once you started worshiping God, you felt and realized it's better to worship God than in the difficulty. Anyone care to share? Alright, Let's move on. Clap when you sing. Well, let someone read Psalms 47 1 first. Amen. Clapping is an act of worship to God. The psalmist said to clap your hands, O ye people. And then he said to shout unto God. We'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. But clap when you sing. Clap when you sing. Clap for his marvelous works. M-A-R-V-E-L-O-U-S. Marvelous works. We clap for everyone else. Isn't he worthy? Worthy of a clapping offering. You see the next question? Could you give him one right now? Amen. Amen. God wants us to clap for him. Psalms 98, 8, and Isaiah 55, 12 tells us that the floods, the floods, and the fields clap for God. The floods and the fields clap for God. As far as we know, they don't have a soul, S-O-U-L. 
We are created after his image. Shouldn't we clap for him? Anyone ever look at a harvest field as a wind blows against it and that uh, crop just claps together? Amen. They're clapping. The word of God says for God. Amen. You see floods or the effects of floods and you see the water as it's clapping against the shore. Ever go to the ocean and see the o uh, ocean room? They're clapping for God. Amen. Even nature itself claps for God. Doesn't have a soul, but we as individuals, amen, we have a soul we should clap for God. That's why song service, it is clapping for God. It's not just because we feel good, but it, it, part of our worship is that we clap for God. Sometimes people get tired of us stop clapping. They don't know what else to do. Sunday night was pretty awesome around here, wasn't it? Amen. As people was really worshiping. And I saw folks clapping their hands. They were up here there to worship to God. God wants our claps. Amen. Most of us can even get a little radical with our clapping and go beyond clapping when we are at a ball game. When we are at a ball game or a concert. A ball game or concert. You know, there's... Everyone's a little different. You know, everyone's personality is a little different. You know, uh, I read something, I heard something about my wife and I, have different people. Like some people, they want to play the sport, but they don't want you to yell at them if they can't get the ball. Or, and then there's others, they just kind of, they're into the game, but they can care less. And then there's others, they're in it to win it. You know, a lot of it is personality, just how people are driven, who they are. But, you know, when you're in it to win it, or even if even if you're not in it to win it, you just see someone do something pretty magnificent, you know, catch the ball, get a home run, score a touchdown. Yeah! Because <laughs> we're excited about that. You know, you probably don't even think about it, but you clap. Or you see someone, you know, make an achievement uh, somewhere. I, I, I'm not I'm not against someone, but... Uh, playing a ball game or watching a ball game. I don't think it's in this church to do it, but, you know, ball games can be fun. They're exercising, whatever. Uh, I've been to a couple of concerts. Now I'm talking about Christian concerts. You know, I've been to the school concert when I was in high school, the course concert, things like that. It's exciting. I do clap because it's, it's nice. You know, we, we naturally get excited over that. And if your kids do it, don't you get excited over that? I mean, you get excited, you know, uh, when, when they take their first step, what do you do? You know, when they go potty for the first time. You know, you know, you're excited, all that good stuff. Because, but what happens when we're in the presence of God? We see what God does. Shouldn't there be a clapping to God as well? The Word of God says that He wants our clapping. Amen. And, and, and did you, any of you ever shout in a ball game? Honestly, did you? Thank you, Sister Don. You got excited? That's right. Now you were shouting in a good way because you're excited, right? Yeah, go, son. There's nothing wrong with that. That's showing them the support and love of mom. But you think about this. God also wants that. I mean, sometimes when I get so excited, I just have to shout out a little bit. In the presence of God, shouting. We stand to our feet and yell, yell, and scream, scream, and whistle. Now, don't criticize this and say, well, that would be ir irreverent. Don't you think God would appreciate more than little pious acts of worship would give him once in a while. Imagine him looking down when we are cheering our favorite team or music group and hear him say, saying, wow, I wish they would cheer me like that. Are you ready for the next couple of sentences? Why don't we try it right now? 
Why don't you say, He is so awesome. He is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> For being a little humorous. But really, to be able to say, God, you are so awesome. Amen. You are so awesome. Amen. <laughs> I <laughs> oh, I did that this week. I did that this week. Several years ago. I was invited to pray with someone that was in the hospital and they were expecting this person not to live. And all the doctors and nurses were all around. I was probably a little more timid in those days, military, with all that stuff, not anymore. And so I prayed for this person that God would touch and God would heal. I left that room had one of the staff come out and pat me on my back and say, well, we'll take a real miracle from God if this guy ever lives. Guess what? He lived! Amen. And guess what? His family tracked me down this week and just told me of something that is crazy, awesome, amazing that just happened that he went through again. And he lived! Amen! God is awesome! Amen. I said that is because of God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Sometimes God just wants to hear our shout of victory. Amen. God is awesome. Amen. Amen. He is awesome. And, and let me read on because there's so much more scripture to back this. Amen. Leaping or jumping, running and dancing are also acts of worship. The Bible tells us to leap for joy. Someone read Luke 6, 23, even if you need me to give you the words. Rejoicing in that day and leap, leap. for joy. Leap. What did you say, brother? I said leap for joy. Leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Amen. Any of you ever get excited, man, and your heart is standing, you're jumping up and down. Yeah, leap for joy. Amen. You know, there are times, and I probably should be more loose, uh, there are times, man, I, I could have just run around this church Sunday night. I'm telling you, it was awesome. Sometimes we just need to leap for joy. Amen. Uh, David leaped and danced before the Lord. David leaped and danced before the Lord. Someone read 2 Samuel 6, verse 14 and 16. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael saw his daughter, looked through a window, and saw King David leaping, leaping, close, and dancing. Before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Here it is. That David was so excited about the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ. When we come into the New Testament, we find the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. We are granted mercy, uh, not because of the sprinkling of any particular blood of an animal, but we are granted mercy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we can experience that mercy seat in our lives personally. 
Now when the Word of God says that David danced, amen, it was, uh, he danced before the Lord. It was uh, that of, 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 in the Spirit, of the Spirit, that David is dancing. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about a flesh dance that's provocative. I'm talking about a spirit-filled dance that there is something when the Spirit of God touches your spirit that you can just not contain it. The Bible says he danced before the Lord with all his might. Imagine that. That in the Spirit of God, he danced with every ounce of his effort and energy. Brother and sister, the church is missing it. To be able to enter into worship with bringing our, our burdens and understanding that that is worship, to be able to clap our hands, to be able to shout, but being able to dance with all our might before God. There's nothing wrong with dance before God, brothers and sisters. Miriam led a victory dance to the Lord. Someone read Exodus 15, verse 20 and 21. And Mary, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the timbrels, and, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Mary, Amen. And Mary answered them, singing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea. Into the sea. Amen. Here is Miriam. Uh, the, the Bible gives her the title of a prophetess. Uh, and so here it is that she is dancing before the Lord, the Bible says, with her temporals and with her dance. She was excited. Amen. Did you ever just get in the presence of God? Amen. And you're so excited for what he's done. The word of God says that, that because he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. God has given protection to his people. And here's Miriam with music and with dancing, rejoicing before God. Amen. Uh, maybe everybody isn't a dancer. Amen. But we're all worshipers. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to dance before God, you just let them dance. Amen, because that is their worship to God. I don't believe that we need to have dance classes and teach someone how to dance. Amen, when the Spirit of God gets a hold of someone's feet, amen, they will dance around and they will worship God, and it is biblical. So if you see someone take off dancing, you don't have to question in your mind, you don't have to ponder, amen. If someone questions, let them get to the Word of God and research it and find out that it lines up with the Word of God. Amen. Dancing before the Lord. I shared this before many years ago. The very first time I ever saw someone take off without dancing in the spirit was this old lady that came to our church. And I was a little kid. And I was in the pew. And I will never forget this as long as I live. And I tell you, I had to be five years old or younger. But you know, there are some experiences that we just never forget. And when this lady took off dancing all over the place, me and my sister thought it was the funniest thing. We were just back there laughing with her. It wasn't funny when Dad started walking back to our office. And we weren't laughing anymore. But we were given the respect of someone worshiping God. And I'm thankful for that. Because I grew to understand it and love it. Love the experience of Pentecost. I appreciate when God begins to move on someone and they just begin to worship. Whether it's clapping their hands, whether it's weeping, whether it's shouting, whether it's just laying on the floor. But it's all worship to God because it's a biblical. We are instructed to praise God in the dance. 
Psalms 49.3 says, Let them praise His name in the dance. Psalms 150 verse 4 says, Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. This was interesting. Brother Hill, if you ever had the chance to listen to him, and he taught, um, like I said, for many, many years at um, uh, the convention that Free Gospel would have every spring. He was just an amazing teacher and would bring things to life. I love it. But I love how he brings this out here. We could say the first Pentecostal runner. You ever see people get so excited that they took off running around the church? I have. I mean, they're just excited. They're running for the Lord. I mean, just, they're excited. We could say the first Pentecostal run occurred when Abraham was visited by God in the form of three men or three angels. We know that story. He ran and he bowed down before them. Shouting. Shouting is an act of worship. In Psalm 65, verse number 13, God's creation shouts for joy. We are instructed to shout also. Someone read Psalms 511. But well, let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Shout for joy. Because thou defendest them, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Amen. Someone read Psalms 32, 11. I'm going to go to right down through all these, so let's just keep going. Counsel, for Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor, favor, my righteousness, righteous cause, ye let them so continually, say continually, that the Lord be magnified, magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Amen. Someone else read Psalms 47 and 1. Someone read Psalms 132.9. Let the priest be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. Shout for joy, correct. These verses tell us to shout for joy. Now, this is pretty interesting what, what we're going to hear said next. Did you hear what the first part said? Shout for joy. They didn't say shout because, because you have joy. But shout to get joy. And some going on these days, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the day. Amen. Amen. So all these verses that we read said to shout for joy. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes I think we just have to be louder than all the thoughts in our head. Sometimes we have to be louder than all the things around about us. That we have to shout for joy. Let me just do that next and then I'm going to close. That next paragraph. We have a lot to shout, to shout about. Our God is a mighty God.
He is worthy to be worshipped. He is great and greatly to be praised. If we spend every waking moment uttering words of praise to Him, it would still not be enough. I want to challenge us in our week. Not that our lives are bad, but you know, we get tired. Things don't always go right. Let's really worship. Let's worship. That shouting is not just have to have when we say, oh, praise God. But it's digging in the depth of our soul and saying, oh, praise God. Praise God. And when we begin to magnify Him, when we realize, like taking these glasses and putting it on Him and He begins to look bigger, that magnifying glass, when He looks small in that situation, but when we magnify Him with our shout and with our praise, with our hand clapping, with our dance, whatever it is, we're making Him bigger. <laughs> We need to exalt God and make Him bigger because He is bigger than anything that we'll go through. He's bigger than our problem. He's bigger than anything. God is bigger. Our worship will take Him to the size that He is. And even if we worship all day and all of our living hours, it still doesn't give Him praise to Jesus. I love worship. Amen. We started to talk about this in the beginning. Worship isn't just a warm, fuzzy feeling because we feel like it. But worship is because we're commanded to and we're obedient. And we will benefit from it. Because God will show up as He inhabits our praise. God doesn't want to just hear our worship when things are going good. When things are going bad, it may be the opportunity. God has given us to worship Him. And that's true worship. I'm done. I won't go long enough. Anybody have anything I want to say? Well, I'll throw this out, brother. When you were saying about uh, worshiping God in the shell, I couldn't help but remember back years ago, brother um, Dietrich talking, and he told a story how he was in church service one time, and he was sitting back, and there was a young girl up around the altar just dancing and praising God. And her mother was sitting in front of Brother Dietrich and looked back to him and said, you see that girl up there dancing around? And she's just jumping over everybody, slain in the spirit up at the altar. He goes, yeah, he goes, she's blind. She's up there worshiping, but all those bodies that are slain in the spirit that she's jumping over, she has no idea that she's down, that they're down there. Amen. Amen. When you are truly lost in the presence of God and it's true worship,